HiStat students. Hope everything is going well. In this video, I'm going to step through the example in Chapter 22 notes for the uh, coffee machine dispenser problem. The notes are already all written from a prior year. That's available to you to either print out or to copy down your own set of notes. The video will explain the steps of the notes. Stop the video as you need to to uh, work on the calculator. You should get some calculator practice in this for sure. So here we go. The coffee machine dispenses coffee into paper cups. I don't know if you've ever gotten coffee out of a machine like that, but it just drops down the cup and then it fills it up with coffee based on, uh, and then adds cream and sugar based on what you've selected. Anyway, um, you're supposed to get 10 ounces of coffee in your cup, but Obviously, that amount varies slightly from cup to cup. So we measured the amount, um, the number of ounces of coffee, in random, a random sample of 20 cups. And here are those values. Our question is, is there evidence that the machine is shortchanging customers? Are we getting less than 10 ounces of coffee per cup on average? We're going to use a confidence level of... Um, 5% or a significance level of 5% rather. Um, if we just glance at the numbers, most of them are below 10, you know, but is that enough to tell us uh, that we're getting short change? Uh, obviously not. Uh, we want to put these into the calculator, so um, you could go ahead and stop the video and do that now. Just go ahead and stat edit, put them in list 1, and you'll have 20 entries. So the parameter of interest we need to define. The parameter of interest is the population mean amount of coffee dispensed into cups. So we're talking about a population and we're talking about an average. So here we're doing a hypothesis test. Yesterday we were doing confidence intervals. Now we want to test the hypothesis about is there or is there not 10 ounces of coffee in each cup that is dispensed. So, what we're going to look at, the null hypothesis, is that the mean is actually equal to 10 ounces, or in a contextual sentence, the machine is correctly filling 10 ounces of coffee into each cup. And then what we're hypothesizing is that we're getting shortchanged. Not hypothesizing, what we're, the alternative is that we're considering that we're getting shortchanged. It seems like there's less than 10 ounces of coffee in each cup. So we do want to do a one-sided test we are thinking that the mean is actually less than 10 ounces of coffee. Or, in words, the machine is shortchanging the customers by providing less than 10 ounces. We do need to check assumptions and conditions. Um, so, actually, if we look at what I had here for number 1 and 3, random, randomness and a normal um, distribution, both of those kind of talk about the independence assumption. Really what we want to know is, is each cup of coffee independent of the other? So the independence assumption is normally or usually um, covered by talking about randomness and if the distribution is normal. So first, random condition. The problem states that the sample is random. That's the easiest scenario. Uh, the second condition that we need to think about is 10% condition. Um, make sure we're not using too much of the population. 20 cups of coffee is definitely less than 10% of the population. Or we could write 20 is less than one-tenth of the population of all the cups of coffee. So our next condition is the normal condition. Is the distribution normal? And there's a new name for it here. It's called the nearly normal condition, is what we're looking for. Is the distribution nearly normal? Obviously, we don't have the distribution of the population. All we have is the sample of 20 cups of coffee. So if we graph this, we can graph a histogram, and we can kind of eyeball it and see if it looks like it's approximately um, uh, unimodal and approximately symmetric. Um, that will suffice. But we actually have a new one called the normal probability plot. Um, if we don't know already that the, pop, that the sample is approximately normal, or that the population is approximately normal, we need to look at 
these two things together to help us decide with confidence that it's okay to move on. So if we do a histogram first, I know this histogram has a specific um, values. We can see if we can approximate that. We're going to go to second stat plot, um, turn on the histogram. It's list one. The frequency needs to be one. And then I'm going to do zoom stat, zoom nine, and I get this histogram. It looks pretty close to what, eh, not really. Um, so remember when, when you do the histogram, your calculator is just going to divide it kind of however it thinks is best, but I don't think it really thinks very much because it uses kind of weird values. Um, the scale on this graph that's printed is, um, each bar is 0.1, so I'm going to change my X scale to 0.1. Uh, right now I'm going to leave everything else the same. Let's see how that shakes out. Okay, that's pretty much what we have on the paper. So, is that unimodal and symmetric? Eh, kinda. There's a, there's a bit of a problem over here. I kind of wish it had tapered off a little bit, but it's not terrible. The second graph that we're going to do, and that's going to be required, is called the normal probability plot, plot. So, we'll do second stat plot. We'll, we'll do plot one again, and this time we're going to use the type plot will be the last one here. So I'm going to select that. The data list is still list one. Data axis, it, it's, um, it really doesn't matter if you have X or Y. Usually I'll just pick X. That'll put this line going across um, X equals zero. And I'm not going to change the mark. I'm going to do zoom 9 again, zoom stat, zoom 9, and I get this graph. We're looking for this to be approximately linear. Um, so this little piece here where it jumped up a little bit, that's kind of associated with this right here. Um, that's, that's not far enough off of being linear, linear to be a concern at all. So we have a histogram that's approximately unimodal and symmetric. We have a normal probability plot that is approximately linear, we are good to go. All right, so the next page, um, just some notes for you. Remember, do not say that the population is normal. We don't really know for sure about that. And never say that the sample is normal. The sample, unless it's made up data, the sample will not be normal for sure. So here are some things that you can say. The sample data seems to be unimodal and approximately symmetric, so we'll assume the population is approximately normal. That's a good one. Or a normal probability plot shows an approximately linear pattern, so we'll assume that the population is approximately normal. Lots of weasel words in there, but they're necessary to use. So given these statements, we will say the conditions have been met, so we'll proceed to perform a one-sample t-test for the mean coffee dispensed. Okay, so now we have a t-test. Yesterday we did a t-interval. Now we're doing a hypothesis test. Let's look at the mechanics. Um, we already have our data in list one, so we can use one variable stats to get all of our other information. Stat, calc, one variable stats. List one, frequency, leave it blank. Hit calculate. And I get, for a sample size of 20, um, actually this is not on one variable stats, but remember degrees of freedom and minus 1 is equal to, uh, for this case, will be 19. X bar, or Y bar, as it's shown in the book and perhaps even on your note sheet, 9.845. The standard deviation of the mean is 0 0.1986. Remember to use the S sub X, not the sigma sub X. S is for sample, sigma for population. All right, so we have our information that we need here. For hypothesis test, we need a t-test statistic. So a t-test statistic is just like a z-score. So, And you should recall kind of this notation. Um, the mean minus the population mean over the standard error. In this case, we're looking for the t-score that goes with this. So we have our y-bar, our x-bar, however it's written, 9.845, minus our population hypothesized mean of 
10. And then the standard error is going to be this the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, 20. If you crank all that out in your calculator, you get negative 3.49. Now, if that was a z-score, it would seem way far out there. A t-score, it's not as unusual as it would be with a z-score. I'm thinking it's unusual, but not as extreme as you might initially think in your z-score kind of mindset that you already have. So let's look at a sketch of this sampling distribution. And look how this is labeled a T sub 19 sampling distribution. Um, this curve is not exactly right. Obviously, we know it shouldn't be touching here. And T curves have um, a thicker, they have thicker tails. So ignore the part that this picture doesn't show that. Um, anyway, a T distribution, uh, um, we want to look at our shaded region where the p-value comes from. So always mark your center. The mean is 10. Again, this is still the hypothesized value. The t-score here is 0. Same as the z-score in the middle is 0. And we're going to be on the left side here because we have negative 3.49 as our t-score. t equals negative 3.49. That occurs when x-bar or y-bar is 9.845 ounces of coffee. So there's approximately where it is. Area to the left is what I'm interested in because we did a one-sided hypothesis test. Uh, we'll get that p-value in just a second. Our rejection region is 5%. And, you know, so you can show that on your graph or not. You don't have to. Ultimately, we're going to compare the p-value to the alpha value. Let's go ahead and calculate the p-value that's on the top of the next page. And we'll come back to the graph in a minute. So, obtain the p-value, how we're going to do this. Finding a p-value on the table B for your t-distribution is not quite as easy as it was with z-scores. Because it's organized in a different way, right? On your table B, the areas are shown at the top, and it, it's not even all of the areas. It's just the ones that are commonly used. I'm trying to show you that. And then um, the t-scores are what are in the table here, not the area. So that's kind of backwards. So we can't get an exact p-value from this table. We will be able to do it on our calculator, though, so I'll show you that. But let's talk about what the table can give us. The table can give us a range of p-values. I want um, t-values with 19 degrees of freedom that are less than negative 3.49. And if I look at this table, see if we can, I know it's hard to read the table, but on for a t-score of 19, or not a t-score, but a, a degrees of freedom of 19, if I go across here and I look for this 3.49 value. I'm going across trying to find, oh, you can't even see where I am. I'm going across trying to find 3.49. And obviously it's not going to be there, but it's in between 3.174 and 3.579. Those two values, the lower one, 3.174, comes from an area of 0 0.0025. And the 3.579 has an area of 0 0.001. So we know our p-value has to be in between 0 0.001 and 0 0.0025. Because our t-score of negative 3.49, or the positive value of that, 3.49, is going to fall in between these two values. So right now, or from this table, that's all we can get is a range of values for the p-value. Well, it happens to be enough because, wow, look how small that p-value is, right? Um, so our p-value from the table is between 0 0.0025 and 0 0.001. The exact value we can get from our calculator. And it turns out to be 0 0.00122, so it's much closer to this side up 